Since the final saga began, the Blackbeard crew has been at the epicenter of almost every major event going on, whether that be Amazon Lily, Winter Island, and now even Egghead. I mean, Shanks even thought that he would be at Wano too. Oda's made it very clear that my man Marshall D. Teach is going to start putting all the pieces together soon enough, and now he's even shown us almost all of his crew's devil fruits. But what we still don't know is pretty much anything about the past and true motivations of the crew. Oda has kept them all shrouded in mystery for a reason, and despite what he told Kobe in chapter 1080, I doubt Blackbeard Kingdom is really the end game for Teach. But this goal did draw my attention to the other king on his crew, being Avalo Pizarro, who was just revealed to own the island island fruit. We'll definitely cover that in more detail later in the video, but the reason he stands out so much is that, just like a few of his other crewmates, he was locked up in level 6 of Impel Down before joining the Blackbeard Pirates. But of all those prisoners, he earned the highest spot on the crew, where he is now the fourth Titanic captain, which is even above original members like Lafitte and Doc Q. And sure, these spots aren't completely indicative of their strength or anything like that, but at the very least, it's interesting that he got the highest rank out of all those prisoners. Also, he was the only one who came out wearing his normal clothes as opposed to prison attire. And when Ivankov named off some of the most dangerous prisoners from level 6, we heard every name that joined the Blackbeard crew that day, except Pizarro's. But Ivankov followed that up by saying that there are some people who are so unspeakable they didn't appear in the paper and are only the subject of legends. Maybe some of this is tied to the fact that Pizarro's epithet is the corrupt king. This Pizarro theory is something that I've been cooking up for a minute now, and I want to give a special thanks to 3Day from the last ARC channel for helping me conjure up some of this theory, so make sure to check out some of their content down below. But where this theory starts is in the North Blue, where we know that Pizarro was once a king, but he misused his power and was overthrown in his home kingdom. So I just decided to look through the list of countries and people from the North Blue in case any of them stood out, and one did above all the rest, and that's Trafalgar D. Waterlaw. He was also born in the North Blue in what is currently the fallen country of Flevins, and he also just happens to have the same pattern on his hat that Pizarro has on his jacket, and that design is very likely based on a snow leopard, and this is backed up by the fact that Oda told us that Law's spirit animal, or whatever you want to call it, is a snow leopard. And we also know that the North Blue is cold because Law's entire crew is polar themed, from Beppo to the Polar Tang, to Sachi and Penguin, who specifically said that they grew up in the frigid waters of the North Blue. So, what is Pizarro doing with the same design on his cloak that Law has on his hat? Could it possibly mean that they're from the same place? Meaning that the kingdom Pizarro used to rule was Flevins. I mean, Law's country fell 16 years ago, meaning that Pizarro would have been 26 years old at the time. Pizarro even mentioned how it's been a while since I've been out whenever we first met him during Marineford, and 16 years in the pen probably qualifies for a while. And actually, Pizarro being the king of Flevins isn't even an entirely new idea. It's probably the most common theory that I found while doing some research, so shout out to everyone on Reddit and elsewhere that were onto this beforehand. However, now that we know what his devil fruit actually is, it kind of takes that theory to a whole new level, and even tells us which straw hat he's gonna fight at the end, because Pizarro's name very likely ties to the famous Pizarro brothers, who were four Spanish conquistadors that played a major role in capturing and ruling the Inca Empire in the 1500s. And this is extra interesting because we've already seen a few celestial dragons with Spanish surnames, being Don Quixote and Garcia. And one key piece of evidence that could connect Pizarro to Flevin specifically is the fact that the name Avalo Pizarro literally means I endorse slate in Spanish, and the word pizarra is specifically the word for chalkboard. It's like one of the first words I learned in Spanish 1 back in high school, and the white chalk that you usually use on those chalkboards could easily be an allegory for the white lead that the country of Flevins was known for. But I think the most interesting piece of evidence for this whole theory is this. During the Flevins flashback, we got this tiny sliver of a panel that shows us that the world government escorted the royalty out of the kingdom. So we know that the leaders of Flevins survived that 
altercation, and this could even explain how Pizarro was locked up in Impel Down since he would have already been in government custody. In fact, what happened in Flevent seems a lot like what happened in Dress Rosa right before the Void Century, and these two islands already share a very close tie because of Law and Doflamingo, because the Tentata showed us what it was like in Dress Rosa 900 years ago, where they were enslaved and the people of the island became rich due to that labor. In Flevence, nobody was enslaved in the traditional sense, but they mined the white lead without being told about the risks, and in turn the entire island became rich because of it, just like the people of Dress Rosa. Gladius told us that the world government and Flevence knew about the dangers from the get-go, but were blinded by their greed. So in both Flevence and Dress Rosa, we saw people were used to make everybody rich. So if the Don Quixotes became celestial dragons, what happened to the ruling family of Flevence after they fell, who I believe to be the Avalo family, which also have a Spanish surname like the Don Quixote like I said earlier. Well, the key here is that Dress Rosa from 900 years ago and the other members from the 20 Kingdoms won their battle. They were successful and took over the entire world. So whatever happened to the Don Quixotes back then is not going to be the same as what happened to the family of Flevence, despite all the other parallels, because Flevence fell, which they all knew was going to happen eventually since they always knew about the risks from the white lead from the very start. And so just like how the government doesn't want the truth of the past to be revealed, they likely don't want the truth of Flevence to be revealed either. They don't want any information out there that makes the government look bad, right? So I think it was probably a situation where the world government never wanted their relationship with Flevence to be public because they knew the clock was ticking on that operation. And that's why they escorted the royalty out of the country before it got too bad. The royalty are the only ones who could reveal the truth other than those in the world government who obviously aren't going to do that. So even if the Avalo family was on good terms with the government that entire time and they were paying their heavenly tribute on time and whatever they wanted, the government still likely wouldn't want that risk of anyone revealing the truth, which is something we've seen consistently throughout One Piece. We've seen the government either obscure the truth or just work directly with the bad people of the island many different times. I mean, think about Kokuyashi Village and even Alabasta and Dressrosa, which were ruled by warlords, or Wano, where CP0 was working on a weapons trade with Orochi. When shitty people take over somewhere, the government almost works with them instead of stopping them since it works to their benefit. But they often keep this a secret, right? They have either worked with or at least turned a blind eye towards a lot of atrocities that countries were committing as long as it benefited them in the end, and usually financially. So I'm sure they were getting some money from Flevence during the years as well, and they probably don't want that being revealed. They always want the truth hidden away so that they look good, just like they did in Alabasta and they even tried to do in Dressrosa because the warlords were the problem and the government obviously kind of let them do what they wanted to do. They always want to spin it as them being the saviors and having no negative involvement leading up to it. So I don't think they escorted the royalty just to protect them from their people because they're being nice, but instead it's to protect the truth from getting out into the world so that nobody would ever know that the world government capitulated the Flevin situation whatsoever. And then that takes us back to level six, where people were locked up to be erased from history. So that may be why the world government ever locked up Pizarro. I mean, who else was in level six? Crocodile, who knows the truth about what happened in Alabasta, and Doflamingo, who just has tons of secrets, of course. When a kingdom falls that the government had a relationship with that they don't want public, they lock up the leaders. But Pizarro really didn't do anything wrong in the eyes of the government, right? The white lead was always going to lead to the country's demise because it got worse and worse over each generation. It's just kind of like Pizarro drew the short straw and was the king when it happened because he was born when he was born and it was just bad timing, right? So maybe that's the whole reason he got to wear street clothes in level six. If they were going to lock him up, even though he didn't do anything wrong in their eyes, at least they were going to let him be comfortable. And finally, Oda even revealed his devil fruit. And now Lafitte is the only one whose fruit has yet to be named. So I think that's coming in the very near future. Shout out to the Hot Tory boys. And when I first started this theory, I thought Pizarro was going to have some kind of cat fruit because the unique honorific that he tends to use is Meow. He obviously has cat vibes and with the snow leopard jacket he had on, I thought that a snow leopard just made sense. Oda went literally the opposite direction and gave him the island island fruit. It seems like this is a souped up version of Pika's fruit where he can kind of become one with anything on the island. And this leads to questions like, can he only be one with the part of the island that's above water? Because technically every island is connected under the sea. And what would his awakening potentially do? And while some of those thoughts may be better served for 
another video, especially once we see him in battle a little bit more. It did lead me down an interesting path about which straw hat he will fight at the end. Because as I've said in numerous videos at this point, the Blackbeard vs. Straw Hat fights have to be about conflicting dreams. It's not as simple as position vs. position, rank vs. rank, matching aesthetics, or anything like that. It needs to have a deeper layer to it that shows why, even though they're all two sides of the same coin, the straw hats are the right side of that coin. And ideally, that will play a role in how they go on to win those fights. And even before this reveal, I thought he was going to fight Jinbei. And I definitely still do, but there are two major reasons why. One, Pizarro's favorite food is shark fin soup, and Jinbei is a whale shark. And also, as I mentioned before, Pizarro has a cat aesthetic, and cat vs. fish is a very common trope, one that Oda already used with Who's Who vs. Jinbei. But now we get to factor in the island fruit, meaning we'd have the island man versus the fish man. The fish man dubbed the first son of the sea who will help lead the fish men back to the surface, back to the islands. Jinbei conquering an awakened island fruit user is like a microcosm of fish men issues as a whole. I mean, imagine how that fight would go. Jinbei would be stuck in the water most of the time, while Pizarro stays on land since he literally is the land. It's like the ultimate game of cat and mouse where they can't go in each other's territory. But perhaps this fight is set up in a way where Jinbei does need to get on the island and save somebody or stop something for happening or something. So literally, you have a fish man needing to beat an entire island. But something I thought of was that Pizarro can feel everything going on on his island, like the prisoners that were escaping, for example. So what happens if he controls an island that is contaminated with something? Like what if the white lead comes back into play somehow as a means for Jinbei to win his fight? And I know this seems kind of random, but white lead is actually real in our world, and it's similar to asbestos or even arsenic, asbestos was used in all sorts of stuff even when we knew it posed serious dangers to people's health. And arsenic is something that accumulates over time, which white lead also did in One Piece, where you can't really flush it out of your system, so if you're exposed to it, you'll experience many different issues over time, especially if it keeps accumulating. The thing with these is that they were also mined from the ground, just like white lead was. And Pizarro is literally an island man who can feel everything on the island. So if he if he were to ever take over an island with like a large deposit of white lead, for example, or some other toxic compound, wouldn't that make him sick too? I mean, what a cruel twist of fate that would be that he got white lead poisoning after all this time because of his devil fruit. And if you think about it, all the white lead that the world used had to go somewhere, right? They said it was used in all sorts of products all over the world, so there should be traces of it in a lot of places. And once people knew the danger 16 years ago, all of it was probably discarded, right? Maybe it was all dumped in one place, and that's where Jinbei and Pizarro end up fighting somehow. So Pizarro loses to the very substance he helped create and spread to the world at the expense of his people. I mean, Jinbei was even locked up in level 6, not too far from Pizarro. Perhaps they talked at some point, and that could tie into this as well. Like I said at the beginning of the video, Ivankov didn't even list Pizarro's name off along with the other future Blackbeard members. He seems to be some kind of well kept secret, despite the fact that he was an overthrown king. Jinbei may have even talked to him directly, or since he was a warlord, maybe he also received some kind of classified information on him, which makes Jinbei one of the only straw hats who could even potentially have a clue about his past. Maybe Jinbei uses this information to help him in the battle, which isn't new for him, honestly. Jinbei has used his role as a warlord and even a Big Mom crew member to help him already. Like when he recognized who's who used Rokushiki, or when he knew how how Katakuri's powers work so that he saved Luffy, or even how he took the fall for revealing the Mother Carmel photo to save Beige from being ratted out and hopefully continuing their plans. I mean, Jinbei is also 46 years old, so he knew the world very well before and after the fall of Flevins. So if that theory is true, then Jinbei would also be one of the only crew members who might remember the names of the royal family and who might remember the fact that the royalty was escorted out of the kingdom and should still be alive. Putting all these pieces together might be the key to winning this fight. But the last part to this theory is more about Pizarro's motivations, and why he might say meow all the time. That is one trait that really stands out to me, almost as if he's from a cat family of some sort, right? And he also has these horns, which we know tend to connect to Onis or ancient giants or something like that. But his horns look a lot like the same horns from Jack the Drought. They have the same metal base at the bottom at least. And if you look at Oda's drawings of Jack as a kid, he doesn't have any horns. And you may just be thinking that the 
horns are a side effect of the mammoth fruit. But first off, mammoths have tusks and not horns, and he even has the horns when in mammoth form, as well as the tusks. The horns are basically just an aesthetic, I think. So that makes me wonder if the same goes for Pizarro. And if we take this connection one step further, Jack is also a half fishman, a half giant grouper fishman to be exact. So maybe Pizarro is also a half fishman, but a half cat fish man and that's why he meows and that also ties to why he's fighting Jinbei and why they're two sides of the same coin because Jinbei obviously is pro fish man and wants to bring them to the surface but if Pizarro becomes an island man and stops the fish man from coming to the surface or at least symbolically by stopping Jinbei from coming onto the land by keeping him in the sea then that would just be perfect storytelling from Oda and this could be really interesting as it pertains to his devil fruit because if he can breathe in the water just like Jack does then maybe Pizarro can be one with the whole planet or something when he awakens, even if most of it is underwater because he can breathe there. But most importantly, this could just make the fight that much deeper, right? Where Jinbei is beating another fishman who is literally an island to hopefully keep the dream alive and eventually get the fishmen to the surface so they can experience all the other islands the world has to offer. And of course, make Luffy the Pirate King. But if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already, and check out one of these two videos that you should already see on the screen. Later.